Hello and welcome to Real Cheating Story. It was a typical Saturday in suburbia, well, maybe it was typical for everyone else, but I was unfortunately having a garage sale. I hate garage sales, and like most guys, I'd rather have simply thrown everything away, but my wife insisted. Even after I told her that we didn't need the money, she hit me right back with how we could donate it to the school our kids attend. She's one of the organizers of the PTA and is truly dedicated to making the school a better place. She's as committed to the PTA as I am to my car. Anyway, here I am lying out in my backyard hammock, resting up for Sunday. Sundays are a big day for me. I'm planning on running a fall marathon, so I usually spend Sunday morning doing my longest run of the week. It's usually between 18 and 24 miles, so I'm pretty much useless for the rest of the day, at least until the sun goes down. Once it gets shady in my yard, I feel a huge rush of energy that I use to wash my car. That's my car over there in the garage, the 2009 Mustang GT with the bullet rims and the MagnaFlow exhaust system. After my wife, she's my baby, actually, before my wife, she was my baby. You'll probably notice that we aren't having the garage sale to clean out my garage. Nope, my garage is spotless, you could eat off the floors, and there's even a TV in it. Oh, here they come. I close my eyes and hope they'll go away, but they don't. Excuse me, sir, says a young man. His girlfriend or perhaps wife is holding onto his hand for dear life. They both have that look about them, we're young, intelligent, and in love. Did you misprice the Games Master X Station dual screen video system? $50 doesn't seem right. I think you meant $500, right? He asked. Both of the 3D monitors come with it, I said, plus I'm throwing in all of the games, the headsets, and the extra controllers. You get all of that for $500, he asked. His face was lit up like it was Christmas. The dual 3D monitors alone are worth $300 each, and the system should be at least $400. The games are $60 each. Are you sure you're letting all of this go for $500? No, I said sharply, the price is $50. Take it or leave it. His girlfriend was elbowing him in the ribs, but he was no dummy. Does it work? He asked, looking at me suspiciously. It's got less than a month of use on it. It's in near perfect condition, I said. Of course it works. Look, if you don't want it, I'm sure someone will buy it. Did it belong to your kid and he ran away or went away to school or something? He asked. No, I said, it was mine. Then why are you selling it so cheaply? He asked. I shrugged. That's one of the things I hate about garage sales. Everybody can't just get a bargain, they absolutely have to know the history and the story behind every item. Actually, getting rid of the game system was one of the reasons we were having the garage sale in the first place. I sat up and gestured to the patio set on my deck. I grabbed a couple of beers for him and his girlfriend and a Pepsi for me and started telling them the story about how video games almost ruined my life. My name is Perry Tyler. No dumb questions. I'm not that other Perry Tyler, the one who dresses up like a woman and directs movies. My name was Perry Tyler long before anyone ever heard of him. Anyway, I have a degree in manufacturing technology from the University of Michigan, and I work for Thompson Manufacturing as lead CNC programmer. I have a comfortable home in the suburbs of Michigan, just outside of Detroit. When the story started, I'd been married to Denise Kofsky for about 10 years. We were happy, or so I thought. I mean, we had all of the things that seemed to mean happiness in this day and age. We weren't exactly rich, but we weren't missing any meals either. Like most Americans, we were firmly in the middle class. Denise and I were exact opposites when it came to looks and physicality. She peaked early, and I peaked later. By that, I mean that the first few years right after college were her best. Denise was never a raving beauty, but she was attractive and had a figure that drew attention. Her average-looking face was framed by long, shiny brown hair that made her more attractive than she might have been otherwise. Her body wasn't ideal, but she had nice legs and a curvy figure that drew attention, even though she had some less ideal features. I, on the other hand, was a nerd, plain and simple. During my college days and the years that followed, I was thin, geeky, and wore large glasses. I was socially inept and shy beyond reason. I was also hopelessly smitten with Denise. 
the first few years after college were difficult for most of us. Denise ended up waitressing, and I settled into my current job. I was making good money almost from the beginning and slowly managed to overcome my social phobias. I started off as a CNC operator, gradually moved into a setup position, and then became a programmer. Each promotion brought new responsibilities and more money. Meanwhile, I was still hanging out with some of my friends from college. Denise and I had spoken a lot over the years, but had never dated. We got friendlier as time went on until finally, we started dating. Things quickly became serious between us. Denise was the first woman who allowed me to experience a deeper level of intimacy. While I had been intimate before, it had usually been in rushed situations. Denise and I both had our own apartments and took the time to enjoy our time together. I was fascinated by her, and she was appreciative of my admiration. After dating for a year, I noticed several things. The first was that Denise was my best friend. Whenever I was away from her, I was miserable, and she felt the same way about me. So, I asked her to marry me. She looked at me as if I were talking about someone else. I guess she had seen a lot of single women at the restaurants she worked in and assumed she'd end up the same way. She didn't accept right away and asked me why I wanted to marry her. You know that I'll give you all the love you want even if we don't get married, she said. I looked her straight in the eyes. Denise, I've always liked you, even before you ever noticed me. I actually dreamed about you. Now that we've spent some time together, I've realized that I'm pretty miserable when you're not around. It's not just about intimacy. Denise, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Although you're my best friend, I don't want us to be just friends, and I shudder to think that someday someone else might take you away from me. I love you. Why didn't you just lead with that last part, she said. Of course I'll marry you, Perry. But don't sell yourself short. I know you think you wouldn't have had a chance with me earlier, but you would have. Being with you is great for me too. A lot of the guys I went out with before you were only after me for one thing. You're the only person I know who actually took the time to get to know me, and even after we started being intimate, you're still here and still nice to me. I'd never let you get away, and I never will. I love you too. So, ten years into the marriage, we were happy, or so I thought. The ensuing years had brought us many blessings. We had two boys, Bobby, a rambunctious five-year-old, and Johnny, his younger brother who was three. We had waited until we were financially stable to have our kids. We had a nice house, two cars, a pool, and regular vacations. We had all the things that one needs to be happy. Of course, over the ten years, we had changed. Denise seemed to get shorter and gained weight. She became more of a typical suburban housewife. I won't bother trying to describe it in detail, but over the years and after having two children, her appearance had changed significantly. Despite these changes, I hadn't noticed much. Denise was still the woman I loved, and now she was the mother of my children. That connection felt unbreakable. It wasn't unusual for me to come home and show my affection in a playful manner, even if it sometimes startled her. On the other hand, the years had been kinder to me. Being in charge of a department and handling important responsibilities had given me more confidence. Dealing with challenging situations and solving problems over the past decade made me more comfortable in social settings. I also started to work out, and Denise's cooking added a few more pounds to my frame. The final straw was giving up my large glasses in favor of contacts. I think the issue really became apparent when Mary Claire Thorpe, our babysitter at the time, mentioned something. We were having a barbecue in Mary Claire's honor because she had just received her associate's degree in childhood development. Of course, she still had many years of schooling to go through, as her goal was a master's degree or possibly a PhD, but it was an important first step, so we wanted to celebrate. Mary Claire was a striking, though shy, girl. She was tall and slender but had a graceful figure. I had seen her in a swimsuit many times, and while I admired her, it hadn't led to any improper feelings. It was kind of like appreciating a well-designed car, you notice its qualities but remain content with what you have. So there we were, Denise and I, our kids, Mary Claire, her brother Stuart, and a couple of neighbors, all gathered around our pool, giving Mary Claire gifts and congratulating her. Mary Claire was so happy that she had a few drinks and was a bit tipsy. 
Denise had just given her a gift, which was a laptop computer. Before Mary Claire opened the box, Denise had playfully said, Here's our gift, Mary Claire. It might be something car-related, so you can take it back and exchange it. But what do you expect when my husband, the nerd, gets to pick it out? Mr. Tyler is not a nerd. He's attractive. I'd be interested in him, Mary Claire gushed, obviously drunk. Denise's eyes narrowed significantly. Even though she knew Mary Claire was drunk, I guessed that she hadn't really taken a close look at me in a while. To her, and to me, we were just two people in their mid-thirties with kids and a mortgage, like everyone else we knew. Hearing that I was considered attractive changed things for her. When we first got together, Denise was in her prime, and I was less so. Finding out that perceptions had shifted, even if only in the eyes of a tipsy babysitter, caught her attention. Denise and I spent most of our time playing with our kids and focusing on family activities. Over time, the spark in our relationship had dimmed to a few embers. Women notice these things and tend to internalize them. I decided that we needed to pick up a few new hobbies to rekindle our connection. I had read several articles about online predators and how playing video games with your children can help protect them from being victimized or bullied. Since I wasn't much of a gamer, I figured I needed to get a head start. I went out and bought the most advanced and expensive gaming system I could find, along with a lot of popular games. I also bought a professional-level dual CPU, dual monitor setup so Denise and I could play together and against each other online. The games I bought included titles like Call of Duty 4, Unmapped, and C-Rim, which had excellent campaign modes and online variants. When I got home and set up the system, Denise looked at me as if I were out of my mind. How is this going to help us recharge things around here? She asked. Well, in two ways, I explained. We can play some of the games together to enhance our teamwork skills. We already have good teamwork skills, she snapped. I know, I said, but besides family activities, we don't often do things together just for fun. Some of the games will involve us competing against each other, and there will be prizes. What kind of prizes? She asked skeptically. It depends on the game, I said. It could be that the winner gets to choose what we do for the evening. Don't get any ideas, she smirked. I'm not going to let you use this as an excuse for anything else. I just want to enjoy more time with you, I said earnestly. She smiled and laughed a bit, and I noticed she seemed more cheerful than she had been in a while. That happiness lasted until we actually started playing the games. A large part of my job involved using computers and various software platforms, so I adapted and learned quickly. Denise, on the other hand, struggled. Modern video games are fast-paced, realistic, and require quick reflexes, problem-solving abilities, and a competitive edge. Denise didn't seem to have those skills. The first night we played was rough. We acted as a two-person team while playing beyond the call of duty. Denise was defeated before she even figured out where we were. We restarted the game, and she was defeated almost immediately again. Denise was defeated so many times that evening that she threw the controller down in frustration and walked away. The next evening, we decided to play against each other offline. So, what are we playing for? I asked. Not what you're hoping for, she smirked. I'm not taking any risks until I'm at least skilled enough to compete. I was disappointed, and I ended up winning 15 times in 14 minutes. Needless to say, not only did I not get any special treatment, Denise barely spoke to me for two days. I was about to give up on the whole gaming idea and save it for the kids when they got older, when I received an excited phone call from Denise at work. Saturday night, she said. What about Saturday night? I asked. Saturday night, we'll play video games against each other. If you win, you get to choose what we do. If I win, you have to do something I ask, she said. What brought this on? I asked curiously. Mary Claire's brother, Stuart, is going to give me video gaming lessons, she explained. I was telling him about how hard you've been trying to find things for us to do together. He thought it was great until I mentioned how terrible I am at gaming. He offered to teach me for $10 a session if he could use the system sometimes. So, Saturday night, it's on. It had been on a Monday when she called, and all week, Denise and I exchanged glances and smiles. 
Even when we were intimate during the week, it felt more energized and enthusiastic. Saturday night arrived. We had dinner, and after the kids went to bed, Denise took a shower and got ready. I also took a shower and put on a robe. We met at the gaming system, each of us dressed in our finest nightwear, and prepared for our game of Beyond the Call of Duty. The first to kill the other five times would win. As soon as the game started, I took cover and located Denise on the simulated landscape. I quickly made my move and achieved a kill. That's one, I said. But Denise soon turned the tables. She managed to get five quick kills in a row, demonstrating skills that were beyond me. I was frustrated, while she seemed quite pleased with herself. Let's go, honey, she said, leading the way to the bedroom. I followed and did my best to fulfill her requests as promised. After several rounds, she told me she needed a break. I grabbed a drink and returned to bed, but when she asked if I wanted to continue, I was too frustrated to take her up on the offer. The next day, I went for a run and spent the rest of the day relaxing and washing the car. When Denise asked if I wanted to play again, I declined, saying I was too tired but would watch her play. She was impressive, knowing cheat codes and combos I had never imagined. By the time she finished, I was ready to take a break from the game. Later, when Denise wanted to start dinner, I decided to try a different game, Unmapped. It's an adventure game with realistic scenarios where you star as Jim Columbus, a descendant of Christopher Columbus, on a quest for a city of lost treasures. Denise saw what I was doing and joined in. Once again, she struggled, and I saw an opportunity for a rematch. For the next week, we planned to play Unmapped. The online version constantly introduced new puzzles and foes, with the winner being the first to reach the treasure. What are we playing for this time? Denise asked. You know what I want, I replied. Well, this time I want you to take care of me in a way that will make me feel appreciated, just like last night, she said. I'm still feeling the effects of how you made me feel. I just needed to step away and clear my head for a moment. During the week, I spent a lot of time playing Unmapped and learning more about the game. I practiced so much that it felt like I was actually inside the game. Denise couldn't practice as easily because the game changed every time you played. Saturday arrived, and we followed our routine. After putting the kids to bed, we settled into our gaming chairs and started Unmapped. Denise, being better at the previous game, excelled in this one as well. I was stronger at solving puzzles, but she narrowly won. As promised, I did everything she requested. She expressed how much she enjoyed it and said that buying the video game had been a great decision. I responded with, I'm glad you're happy. What about next weekend? She asked. We still have a game left that neither of us has played yet, she said. I fetched the game box, and we read through it together. I'm game, I said. This one might be a challenge for you. If I win, Denise said with a smile, you'll have to give me something special that you desire, but you won't be getting it. What if I win? I asked. Nothing, she replied. This left her puzzled. She positioned herself beside me, wrapping her arm around me. Don't you want to? She asked. Not anymore, I said. Perry, it's been over a week since we've been together, she said. Denise. You just had a great time a few days ago, I said. That should be enough. The next day, I went for a long run and spent time washing the car, using the time to think about how to prepare for the following Saturday. I decided to take a more strategic approach. While Denise made dinner, I casually looked around our living room and noted a few details. Later, at work, I accessed an old application on my computer. We had several cameras around the house for monitoring, which we had set up years ago for security purposes. I repositioned one of the cameras to monitor the gaming system, knowing it might be a bit underhanded but necessary to understand how Stuart was assisting Denise. I set up the camera feed on a smaller window on my computer's desktop, planning to monitor her training. I had been working on a new program for about an hour when I heard a sound. It seemed like Denise was talking to someone. I saw Stuart and another man in the feed. Stuart, a large, bald guy with thick glasses, was very opinionated, often sharing his strong views on various topics, including his theories about characters from popular movies. I noted their conversation while keeping an eye on the training session, 
trying to piece together what was happening. I quickly ushered them out as soon as he left the house, so I asked Stuart if I would get paid now. Denise suggested that Stuart's friend might be more comfortable sitting outside on the deck while she gave him his money. I didn't understand why I was paying Stuart, but Denise reassured me that there was no rush, and we had all morning and most of the afternoon. Stuart glanced at his friend, who began to speak but then fell silent at Stuart's look. He walked outside, muttering under his breath. Denise and Stuart watched him leave the house and heard the door click behind him. Then Denise pulled Stuart into the living room and took a position in front of him. I was stunned as I saw her start to engage with Stuart in a way I hadn't anticipated. My heart rate and blood pressure surged. I quickly pressed a key to start my computer recording and grabbed my jacket. I told my secretary it was an emergency and needed to leave immediately. I was in the parking lot in under two minutes. I parked a block away from my house and walked the rest of the way to avoid drawing attention. As I entered through the backyard gate instead of the front door, I noticed the back door was wide open. I quietly made my way through the kitchen and saw Stuart and Denise in a compromising position. Stuart was behind Denise, who was bent over our dining room table. Stuart was sweating and grunting, and Denise was urging him to hurry up. Stuart's friend was across the room, observing the scene intently. What's going on? I asked loudly, causing them to turn towards me. Denise straightened up, and Stuart nearly stumbled. Perry, what are you doing here? Denise asked in shock. Stuart, unable to hide his discomfort, blurted out an excuse. My anger overtook me, and I advanced towards Stuart, who was trying to pull up his pants. Although Stuart was physically larger, he seemed to realize what was coming. I had never been much of a fighter, but that morning I was determined. As I approached Stuart, my movement was deliberate and precise. My fist connected with his right eye, breaking his glasses and scattering shards across the room. I grabbed the front of his shirt to steady him, then my fist struck his nose, causing a gush of blood to erupt. Denise's face was filled with terror as she tried to intervene. Stuart's friend continued to watch, seemingly detached from the situation. Denise threw herself against my arm, trying to stop me from continuing, but I reacted instinctively. My foot came up, hitting Stuart in a sensitive area, which elicited high-pitched screams. I glared at Denise and pushed her away. I picked up a snow globe from the table and threw it. I glared at Denise and pushed her off me. I grabbed a snow globe from the table and threw it at Stuart's friend. I missed my intended target, but the heavy globe struck him on his right hand, cutting deeply and snapping his wrist. He began to scream, clutching his injured hand. Denise was frantically scrambling to find clothes and talk to me simultaneously. Perry, we have to talk about this, she said. What is there to talk about? I snapped. You've saved your partner for now, but the next time he and I meet, it will be different. Get out of my house, all of you. What are you talking about? She screamed. I don't have a lover. I was trying to protect you from going to jail. Our kids need both of their parents, and we can't work this out if you killed Stuart. He's pathetic, I said. Denise, just get out of my house. Take Stuart and his friend with you. Stuart was on the floor in a fetal position, his nose swollen and bleeding, his right eye already blackening. His glasses were ruined, hanging from his left ear, and his pants were around his ankles. Meanwhile, Stuart's friend was crying and trying to open the locked front door with only his left hand. I crossed the room, grabbed Denise's keys from the counter, and opened the door. I told her to take them both with her. They struggled to get Stuart up and out of the house. Denise tried to hug me before she left, but I pushed her away. When we talk about this, you'll see it's not as bad as it seems she said. I'll be back as soon as I take them to the hospital. No, you won't be, I said. Go to your parents' house or wherever, but don't come back here. Have your dad come by to get you enough clothes until the lawyers arrange things. Don't talk like that, she said. This was just a mistake. We're not going to be one of those divorced families. We need to work this out. I love you, and we need to talk. I slammed the door in her face. If she hadn't jumped back, the door would have knocked her down. The metal frame cracked. Realizing I didn't have much time, 
I called Mary CLA and asked her to pick up my boys from school and preschool and take them to my parents' house. I mentioned I might be going to jail soon but didn't explain why. I quickly went to the bank, transferred all the money from my savings account, and closed it. I left the checking account alone to avoid leaving evidence of another account. I went to see my boss, who had gone through a few divorces himself. He helped me set up an offshore account. I deposited the cash into a new bank account and transferred it to the offshore account. Denise's lawyers would have to search every bank in the region to trace the transaction, and since I had opened the account under a different name, it would be difficult to track. I paid some fees but considered it worthwhile. I also cashed out my brokerage account, which contained stocks and bonds. Rolling it into the offshore account cost me roughly 15% of its value, but it was better than paying taxes on a direct withdrawal. My boss had a friend in Vegas at a casino who was going to help us. He also advised me to park my car in his garage. I had my secretary follow me to my boss's house, and we drove back in her Honda. I rented a car, drove it back to my house, and saw the police had already arrived. I smiled and waved at them. Mr. Tyler, there are two men in the hospital with serious injuries, one officer said. They don't want to press charges, but we'd like to hear your side of the story. I came home and found one of them with my wife, I said. I reacted the way any guy would. Do you need proof or something? The officers looked uncomfortable. Come into the house, I said. They reluctantly followed me. I went over to my home computer and started the video feed. They watched the first part that I had seen from work. I had cut off the feed long before the part where I attacked Stuart began. Sir, I really understand what you're going through, said the first officer. I've been there. Even though these guys don't want to press charges, we need to take you downtown to fill out a report. I think your wife has convinced them not to say anything. You probably won't be there for long. Oh, I'm ready to go, officer, I said. I don't mind staying down there for a while. I have everything in order. My house has a front door and a back door. The back door has a special lock and we were told not to lose the keys because replacing them might require replacing the whole door. Denise had lost hers while we were on vacation. As I left the house, I broke my key for the front door off in the lock. My key to the back door was in my Mustang center console. Surprisingly, they didn't put me in jail. I was placed in an interview room. They didn't take my phone, wallet, or any personal effects because I wasn't under arrest. They left me alone while I waited for the detective. I called Mary CLA, who had already taken my kids to stay with my parents. She asked what was going on. Your brother would probably be a better person to talk to, I said. But thanks for picking up my kids. I owe you one. I spoke to my dad and explained the situation. He decided it would be best to leave a message on my home phone saying he was taking the boys fishing and had my permission to do so. My dad knew many great fishing spots, and my boys loved fishing. As soon as I hung up, my phone rang. It was Denise. I immediately hung up. She called back, and I hung up again. The next call was from Denise's mom. I couldn't hang up on her. She asked if I would please go to the hospital to talk to Denise while she waited for news about Stuart. I asked her how much she knew about what was happening. She told me that Denise had only said we were having an argument about something I'd done to Stuart and was trying to fix things. I figured it should be up to Denise to explain to her parents what had happened. If she lied, I would tell them the truth. I told Denise's mom I couldn't go to the hospital because I was in jail. Within five minutes of getting off the phone, I received a flurry of calls from Denise, none of which I accepted. Half an hour later, I explained my side of the story to the detective in charge. As I waited to be released, Denise stormed into the police station. Someone had directed her to my room. She ran over and tried to hug me again. I held out my hands and backed away. Stay away from me, I told her. Honey, we need to go home and sort this out, she said. There's nothing to sort out, I replied. After our divorce goes through, you'll have more than enough time to be with Stuart or anyone else you want. God damn it, Perry, she said. You're the only one I want. We all need to want something, I said. But I'm the one thing you want that you'll never have again. Perry, we need to talk about this, she said. 
I made mistakes, but it doesn't mean I don't love you. You let someone else into your life in a way you've never let me, I snapped. Year after year, I begged you for things you refused to do. We've known each other forever, you've known him for a few months. I married you, supported you, and took care of you. He just taught you how to play video games. What did he do for you? We have kids together, and I thought we had a future. He ended our marriage, so I guess your future is with him now. You and he have all those memories of laughing at me behind my back. No one has laughed at you, she began. I don't want to hear it, I said coldly. Anything else you need to say, you can say through my lawyer. Perry, we need to talk calmly, she said. I turned my face away from her, stuck my fingers in my ears, and started loudly singing. As I watched, her face grew redder. Perry, don't make me do this, she said. She shook her head and pulled out her cell phone, starting a conversation with someone before snapping the phone shut. She looked back at me with a challenging expression, then got up to leave. The detective re-entered the room. Mr. Tyler, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to hold you. The men you assaulted have decided to press charges, he said. Call me when you decide to listen to reason, Denise said. This could have been really easy, but you had to push me to my limits. An hour later, I was moved into a cell. Denise ran into the cell to see me. Perry, where are the kids? She asked. I refused to respond. Perry, you're taking this too far. It's not what it seems. I need your key to the back door. It isn't with your personal effects, and something's broken off in the front door, she said. Denise, the house is in my name only, I replied. I've told you I don't want you in my house. If you go into it, I'll charge you with burglary or trespassing. Perry, you don't want to resolve this with me, she snapped. There's still time for us to talk and work things out. We can go back to how things were before, and everything will be fine. We'll still spend the rest of our lives together, and this will just be a distant memory. I don't want it anymore, I said. All I want now is to be free of you and start my life over with someone who truly loves me. Her eyes narrowed and her tone became more serious. Perry, I love you, she said. Don't make me do this. I consulted with a lawyer, and she told me I could get your house, most of your salary, retirement, and child support. You'd end up in a shelter, eating basic meals until the kids turn 18. That won't happen, I said, smirking. I'll plead guilty and take jail time. You're just angry and hurt, she said. She laughed. Later on, when we talk this through, you'll regret turning down the chance to make things right. No, I won't, I said. It just doesn't mean anything anymore. Why not, she sneered. Did you find someone else? It was never about anyone else, I said. Denise, I've loved you since the first time I saw you in college. I know you had more experience than I did, and I didn't mind. I always told myself that even if others had you first, I'd be the one to have you the longest because we were meant to be together forever. Her eyes filled with tears. Perry, I didn't realize it was that serious. I didn't know you loved me that much. Yep, it no longer matters, I said. Let's just get the divorce. Perry, please don't make me do this, she said. Neither of us will be happy once this starts. Screw you, Denise. I love basic food, I replied. She walked out of the room, and the guard came in to tell me that my wife was bailing me out. I asked if I had to accept any money from her. Well, you could refuse the money, but that would be unwise, he said. Why would you do that? Because I don't want anything to do with her, I said. Denise walked back into the room. Why do you want to stay in here, she asked. We need to talk, and I can talk just as well here. I waved my hand and called for the guard. This woman is harassing me. I haven't even had my day in court yet. I don't want to talk to her and want her barred from future visitation. The guard escorted Denise out of the room. You'll be sorry, she shrieked, continuing to scream as they took her away. The next morning, my favorite guard returned. The holding cell had filled with petty criminals, and we were chatting to pass the time. The guard came over. There's a woman here to see you, he said. I already told you, I don't want to see my wife, I snapped. It's not her, 
he said. It's a different woman. Do you want to see her, or should I send her back? Send her back, it'll be quicker, I said. I should have realized what was happening when I heard the sounds of whistles and catcalls coming down the row of cells. She walked through all of the shouting with an air of dignity. You really did a number on my brother, she said. Denise is livid. What did Stuart do? I explained what had happened, and her eyes widened. God, I'm so sorry. I can't believe my brother would do that. His college career is over. Why? What does this have to do with college? I asked. The dean hates Stuart, she said. He's been on probation since his return to school. The dean told him that if he made any further mistakes, he'd be expelled. At this rate, he'll never leave my parents' basement. My dad is about ready to throw him out anyway. Can you imagine being that old and still living in your parents' basement? They have to wait for him to wake up to do their laundry. He has posters all over the basement and invites friends over for game nights, she said with a hint of laughter. Well, I came to bail you out, she continued. Why? I asked. Because that's what friends do, she replied. I'm sure you don't have that kind of money, I said. It's money I saved for tuition, she told me. I appreciate it, but I couldn't take money from you, I said. But thanks, it really means a lot. She smiled and nodded. So you could have bailed yourself out whenever you wanted to, she asked. I nodded. Then why didn't you? Three reasons, I said. First, Denise wanted me out of here. My being in jail makes her uncomfortable because she thinks she caused it and can't talk to me while I'm here. Second, I need to be somewhere, and here I get to eat for free, so it's as good a place as any. And lastly, until you arrived, I didn't really have a reason to want to leave. She smiled again and went out with the guard to arrange my release. She returned with the guard a few moments later. Hey, this is the same account that the other person tried to bail you out from last night. What's the difference? The guard asked. I like this person, I said cheerfully. MC drove me to my house where I picked up the rental car. We went out to breakfast, and I explained everything that had happened to her in detail. Previously, I had only given her a brief version. This time, I shared everything, how I discovered what was going on and what had happened since. In turn, she told me about the previous day while I was in jail. Denise had spoken to Stuart several times and hired a lawyer. According to MC, Denise had hired a very aggressive lawyer who was known for winning significant settlements because the initial lawyer she hired didn't have a strong track record. Denise wanted either to force me to take her back or, failing that, to destroy me. MC hugged me and offered to help in any way she could. I hugged her back and told her that just having her support meant more to me than she could imagine. I drove back to my house to get a few things from the garage. I remembered I couldn't get into the house without breaking something, and it was fortunate that I didn't have to, because just as I got into the garage, Denise and a man got out of a car. Denise stalked toward me with a fiery expression. Why did you let someone else bail you out when you wouldn't let me? She hissed. I introduced myself to the man who was with her. He turned out to be her lawyer. He was professional and polite. Answer my question. Denise screamed. Who is this person who bailed you out? Is it someone you've been seeing all along? I'd invite you in, I said to the lawyer, but I don't have access to the house right now. You'll probably want to get a court order to allow Denise to retrieve her belongings. I'll try to arrange that for later today or tomorrow. Thank you, the lawyer said. That seems reasonable. Denise continued to shout as our neighbors looked out through their windows. Our neighborhood was usually quiet and loud outbursts like hers often resulted in police involvement. I'm not ignoring you, I said, continuing to focus on the lawyer. After dealing with Denise, I expected a lot of yelling. I'm not like that, and neither was she until this all started. You'll be serving papers on me soon, I assume. Here's my cell phone number where I can be reached. I'll arrange to be somewhere that the papers can be served. I'm not sure where I'll be staying. Are you not going to be living in the house? He asked. I sold the house, I said. I'm the sole owner. Since we're not going to live here as a family, I decided it's not worth keeping. His eyes widened, and Denise began to cry. 
Could you please answer some of her questions before she has a meltdown? He asked. Denise, MC bailed me out using money from her account, I said. There's no one else I've been involved with. You were the only woman in my life for the past 10 years. I loved you until you made things complicated. She looked at me with tear-filled eyes. For a moment, the anger seemed to fade, but she said, this was a mistake. I let my need to compete and win control me. No, Denise, I said. We can't go back to where we were. There's no way to erase what I saw from my mind. There's no way for me to ever trust you again, I said. Are you sure? She asked softly. Maybe you're just still hurt and angry with me. Maybe if we give it some time, you'll change your mind. I don't think so, Denise, I replied. Well, can we talk about this? She asked. Can we sit down like two reasonable people and work out our differences? I'd like that, I said. Let's meet in the park at one o'clock. Why the park? She asked. Just in case things get loud, I said. Plus, the park is public, so we can both easily walk away if needed. I'm hoping we can work this out. She agreed and said she'd see me soon. I walked away and got into my rental car. I called my boss and updated him on the situation. Don't be fooled, he told me. Her lawyer and some other people have been asking about your salary and retirement plan. Stick with the plan. You also need to head for Vegas today. If you let her file, the legality of our moves will be even more questionable. I met with the lawyer I had hired, gave him Denise's lawyer's information, and told him everything. He laughed heartily, as if he had dealt with similar situations before. You do know that, officially, I'm required to report everything you've told me to the court, right? He asked. I don't really care, I said. All that matters to me is that my kids are fine. He responded, good thing I have a short-term memory, and laughed. I can't remember any of the stuff you just told me. After leaving the lawyer's office, I headed for the park. When I arrived, I saw Denise sitting on a bench near the old bandstand. There were several people around, but no one close enough to overhear us. I walked up and sat down on the opposite side of the bench from Denise. She noticed and frowned. It seems like a lifetime ago when you used to come into the kitchen and we had those moments while I was cooking, she said. Now it feels like I have a terrible disease you don't want to catch. She paused, then continued. Perry, this all went wrong. I think there's something wrong with me. I'm not acting like the woman I've been for most of our relationship. I'm so sorry for what I did. Looking back, I realize how foolish I was. At first, I tried to blame you, telling myself it was your fault because if you hadn't brought that game home, none of this would have happened. I bought the game because I felt you were drifting away, and I wanted to try anything to get back what we had. I loved you more than anything else, Perry. I couldn't just do nothing. She continued, but what you don't see is all the context. You're an attractive man, and I felt lucky to have you. Remember ten years ago when we first got together? I was the one everyone noticed. There were always guys hitting on me when we went out. I never took the bait because I was focused on our future. I saw how other women, who once were admired for their looks, ended up regretting it. I didn't want to end up that way. I wanted a family, a home, and love. I realized that the difference between the happy women and those who are no longer admired was love. I looked at the guys we used to hang out with and saw that although I had been involved with many, none of them truly cared about me. The only person who did was you, Perry. That's why I pursued you, and I'm so glad I did. The problem now is that the balance of power has shifted. You've become more attractive over the years, and I've struggled with my self-image. I see myself as the same person from the past, but lately, no one notices me. I've noticed how others see you, and it's made me realize how little you need me. It's why I started ordering you around and drifting away. I needed to convince myself that I didn't need you, and while I did that, you were working hard to take care of us and our kids, and to keep me from drifting away. The video game idea was a good one and could have been perfect for us, but I ruined it. You even showed me how much you still cared by how special you made things. I used it to try and degrade you, and until recently, I thought you just wanted to control me. When you explained why you wanted it, I realized how foolish I had been. I didn't understand how deeply you loved me. 
Regarding Stuart, I know it hurt you, Perry, but I didn't intend for it to. I just wanted to win at that game so badly, it was my way of having something to boast about. Stuart and I started out talking about the game, then he suggested that if he helped me, he deserved a share of the winnings. The night you made me feel so good was special, and I should have realized it wasn't as special for you when you didn't want to be intimate afterward. I assumed you were just saving your energy for the next day. When Stuart proposed a price for his help, I initially refused, but as the week went on, I felt I had no other option. Stuart's plan was to cheat. I watched how you solved the puzzles, and when you struggled, I used a cheat code that gave me unlimited health, so I didn't face the same challenge as you did. I used this cheat to bypass some of the game's difficulties and won, but it was not worth the shame I felt. When I collected my winnings, you were gracious, but afterward, you didn't want to be intimate with me. When you caught us on Monday, I was in shock. None of this felt real, like life had become part of a game. None of this is worth what I put you through. We need to figure out how to move forward, what I can do to make it right. Denise, that's just it, I began. All I ever wanted was us. That's gone. There was never any need for physical appearances. You loved me when I was just a nerd with giant glasses. I loved you until I saw you with Stuart. Physical things don't matter. I fell in love with a woman who cared about me when others laughed at me. You gave that up when you involved yourself with Stuart. Now, we need to focus on what's best for the kids, figuring out custody and how to take care of them. This isn't what I wanted to hear, she said. I came here to find out what we need to do to get back together. I don't want to hear about co-parenting. Think of something that can fix this. She was getting upset again, and her voice was rising. I'm sorry, Denise, but acting out won't fix this. We're never going to regain the trust. The best thing we can do is start a new chapter as co-parents, and maybe someday, when this is all behind us, we can be friends. Co-parents, she screamed. She got up from the bench and glared at me. Friends? I don't want to be your friend. I'll give you two days to get your act together, and then we're going to war. If you push me, I'll take everything you have. All of your money, all of your savings, the house, and even your little car, she shouted. Her loud, angry outburst drew the attention of everyone around us. Two days from now, Perry, one way or another, you're going to face consequences. Either you'll be dealing with me and our situation or you'll face difficulties in the divorce. You might end up with nothing, living in a shelter, eating simple food, while you work hard for me. And even then, I might end up with Stuart or someone else, not out of desire, but just to spite you. When you retire, I'll claim most of your retirement package or at least half of it, so you still won't have much left. Do I make myself clear? And if I hear about you with another woman, I'll make sure it's the end for you. With that, she knocked over the bench and stormed off to her car. Later that afternoon, I went to Las Vegas. I stayed in a nice hotel, gambled a bit, and enjoyed myself. The next morning, as I was preparing to fly back home, there was a knock on my door. A man standing outside introduced himself and handed me a file. Most of the documents were on hotel letterhead and detailed how I had lost nearly $200,000. Where did I get that kind of money? I asked. He smiled and replied, you sold your house and cashed in your retirement. Then you lost all that money gambling here. Your boss, Justin, is my cousin. He arranged all this after losing nearly a million himself. We even had one of our cousins move into your house for the summer. You need to wrap this up before school starts. My niece and nephew will need their own place for school. I smiled and nodded, deciding to extend my stay in Vegas for another day. I enjoyed a show, indulged in rich food, and even socialized a bit. Although I wasn't ready to meet anyone new, I wanted to get used to the idea of dating again. The confrontation came sooner than expected. When I returned, I stopped by the office to thank Justin and give him a progress report. Denise's lawyer and another man were there. Denise approached, and I could see her frustration as she glared at me. So, are we going home? She asked, her tone tense. I just smiled and shook my head. Her eyes darkened, and she looked as if she was about to explode. The man accompanying Denise and her lawyer stepped forward and handed me a folder. You've been served, he said. 
Denise's lawyer looked apologetic. I realize this isn't the best way to handle this, he said. Your wife insisted. This seems like too much of an ambush. Perhaps you could bring your lawyer to my office for a meeting to discuss this calmly and talk about a settlement or division of property. I warned you, Perry, Denise said coldly. Whenever you're ready to listen to reason, I can make all of this go away. But you should know that your court date for the assault charges is approaching. You might end up in jail soon, and I can make that go away too. She looked at me with a cold, determined expression. One way or another, I'm moving back into my house soon. Later that afternoon, I met with Denise, her lawyer, and my own lawyer. Denise had brought Stuart and a friend, while I had a friend from my side. As soon as Stuart saw the person I had brought, he looked nervous. Are you ready to give in? Denise asked as she sat down. Let's get started, I replied. Her lawyer began, we're petitioning for divorce on the grounds of mental cruelty, and I burst out laughing. Everyone looked at me and my lawyer. What's so funny? asked Denise's lawyer. Let me clarify something, I said. Just 15 seconds ago, your client was begging me to stay married to her. Does that sound like mental cruelty to you? He looked over at Denise, who was visibly upset. I thought you were going to file under irreconcilable differences, I continued. I was willing to agree to that to avoid embarrassment and protect Stewart's reputation. But since you're making this more contentious, I'll be filing a counterclaim for infidelity. Denise's lawyer looked taken aback. You didn't know this? I asked him. Your client didn't tell you why I'm divorcing her? Well, this is a no-fault state, he sputtered. You don't have proof, do you? I held up my iPhone and played a video. His eyes widened as he looked at Denise. I need to confer with my client, he said, and he and Denise stepped outside. We heard yelling and arguing through the door. I smiled at Stuart, who looked very nervous. When Denise and her lawyer returned, he sat down and said, we're willing to go for irreconcilable differences. I'm not sure I am anymore, I said. After all the pain she's caused me, maybe everyone needs to know what kind of person she is. But let's table that for now. Go on with the rest of your petition. My client wants the house and primary custody of the children, Denise's lawyer continued. She seeks child support and spousal support, wants her car, 60% of the savings and checking accounts, as well as the investments, and half of your retirement package. She also suggests that you attend couples counseling to try to resolve your differences. I started laughing again. Denise's lawyer looked at me, confused. What is it this time? He asked. You know, when you find out that someone you love has been unfaithful, it really changes you. You end up feeling betrayed and wanting closure. All I wanted was to move on and start over. So, no. Denise stood up. What did you do? I sold my house, I said. I sold it before you filed for divorce. I took all the money out of the savings account, hoping to go to Vegas and either double or triple it to pay you off and start fresh. You with someone who wouldn't mind your behavior, and me with someone who could be faithful. You didn't double the money, did you? She asked. Not even close, I admitted. I lost it all. Never gamble when you're upset. I still owe the casino several thousand. What about cashing in your retirement plan? Asked the lawyer. My client is entitled to something. I wasn't fully vested, I said. I was so upset with what Denise did that when I left, I told Justin to shove it, and he fired me. The retirement plan isn't worth much. I had to sell my car to start paying back the casino, so right now, all we have is Denise's car, which we still owe money on. Without a job or a place to stay, I'm not sure how we'll keep up with the payments. The kids, who Denise hasn't even asked about, are staying with my parents. You idiot! Denise screamed. We'll have to start all over again. What you did was stupid, but this is worse. So, the two of you will attend counseling and try to mend your marriage? Asked her lawyer, trying to win at least one point. No, I said. Denise sat at the table with her arms crossed. What am I going to do? She said. You're going to fight me for custody of our kids? Why? I asked. Why can't we just get back together? We both made mistakes. No, Denise. 
You made the mistakes, I said. I just reacted to what you did. She started crying and calling me names. I can't even get a job if I'm in jail, I said. If you agree to try to save our marriage, I'll call off Stuart. Don't worry about it, I said. Stuart is in more trouble than I am. I actually have more control over him than you do. The gentleman I brought with me is the dean of Stuart's college. He's tired of Stuart's behavior but owes me a favor. If Stuart doesn't drop the charges, he'll be expelled from the university and won't be able to return. Stuart said, I wanted to drop the charges and move on, but she told me if I didn't, she'd claim I attacked her. For the next two days, we negotiated. The resolution was that Stuart dropped the charges, Denise and I agreed to divorce on the grounds of irreconcilable differences, and we both got jobs and worked out a way to have joint custody of the kids. We each got apartments with the remaining money in our checking account and kept our finances separate. We estimated the costs for the kids' expenses and each paid half. Denise managed to get a job, which was challenging for her after not working for 10 years and gaining weight. I pretended to care when she complained about going to work. About two months later, I called her one morning to tell her the house I had sold was going back on the market. I planned to get another mortgage and buy it back. She started crying. I didn't expect that, I said. This will be good for the boys. They'll have their old rooms back, and you can visit them often. They can still live with you every other week, but I think it's better for them to have a house with a yard, pets, and a pool. It's not just that, she said. I found out yesterday that I'm pregnant. I went into shock. I know this is difficult, I said. We'll just have to work a bit more, and we can manage with three kids just as well as with two. If we were still together, it would be great news, she said. You don't understand, she continued. The timing is all wrong, Denise said. More than anything in the world, I wish this was your baby, but it isn't. My life is ruined. Have you told Stuart yet? I asked. I'm going to today, she said. But Perry, he doesn't ever have to know. No one ever has to know. Couldn't we? No, Denise, I said. It wouldn't be right. There's been too much lying and hiding already. Look where it got us. But I don't want to be with him, Perry, she said. I want to be with you. Denise, right now that just isn't possible, I said. Who knows what may happen in the future? A year ago, I never saw us living apart or you carrying someone else's baby, but that's where we are now, and it's all because of those choices. It's not the games, I said sadly. It was your actions that ruined both of our lives. Over the next few months, my summer tenants moved back to their home state, and I got my house back. Denise told Stuart about the baby, and he denied it was his and hired a lawyer. I told Denise I'd be willing to support her through the pregnancy until a DNA test confirmed the child's paternity. The boys moved in with me full-time because, as her pregnancy advanced, Denise found it harder to care for them. She still visited them often. I convinced MC, who was always around anyway, to move in and take care of the boys full-time. She adjusted her fall schedule to attend her classes while they were in school. Denise also lost her job because she couldn't stand or move around quickly enough while pregnant. Stuart reluctantly allowed her to move into the basement with him, urged by his parents who were excited about the possibility of their first grandchild. He and Denise argued frequently. Meanwhile, MC began acting more like a partner. She took care of me and the boys, cooking, cleaning, and spending time with me. It was MC who eventually moved the gaming system into storage in the garage. One day, I came home to find it was no longer in the living room. The monitors, system unit, gaming chairs, and headsets were all gone. The sofa and love seat were rearranged in front of the flat screen TV, creating a cozy space for watching movies together. Put the steaks on the grill, said MC as I stood looking at the empty space where the gaming system used to be. Everyone is waiting for you. The kids can't go swimming until we head out back to watch them. I've got a bootleg DVD of the Avengers for us to watch after dinner. Where's the, I began. She crossed the floor and silenced me with a finger on my lips. Every time you looked at that thing, it made you sad, she said. It's been months now. It's time to move on. 
MC was wearing a swimsuit with one of my long shirts over it. For the first time in months, I noticed a hint of perfume on her. I allowed myself to let go of some of the anger I felt towards Denise. That evening was perfect, a family night, something I hadn't enjoyed in so long. Since Denise had begun pulling away, I had been trying hard to get her back. The boys settled onto the couch with their popcorn, leaving the love seat for MC and me. We ended up squeezing in together, and the contact was comforting. She wrapped her arm around my waist and rested her head on my shoulder. Despite my previous feelings, I found the closeness with MC soothing. As late summer turned into fall, MC and the kids returned to school. We saw less of Denise unless we visited her and her new family. Her pregnancy was challenging, and she often blamed it on my absence. Stuart is useless, she complained. He's going to be the worst father ever. I'm a 36-year-old pregnant woman. Why am I sleeping in a basement? I don't have anything. Denise seemed to become more resentful as time went on. The kind and caring woman I had once loved seemed to have disappeared. MC and Stuart's parents often said Denise was only acting this way because of her pregnancy. I wasn't so sure. I thought that during our time together, I had been so focused on pleasing Denise that she had never had much to complain about. My refusal to reconcile had brought out a side of her I hadn't seen before. Denise hated Stuart because, in her eyes, he had cost her our marriage and lifestyle. Stuart believed Denise had taken away his ability to socialize with his friends and hold his gaming parties in the basement. His parents had grown tired of supporting him over the years. His father began telling Stuart that he should be kinder to Denise, suggesting that if it weren't for the baby, they might have kicked him out of the house. Stuart's parents also treated my kids like their own grandchildren. It was common for us to drop by with MC and the kids, where they would run to Stuart's parents for hugs and treats. They began looking at us with knowing glances, and MC would turn a few shades redder whenever she noticed it. One day, while we were sitting on the back porch discussing a topic that concerned MC's dad, we received some distressing news. MC's dad called us over because he was frustrated. He made small talk as the kids played on the grass with his wife. So, Mary Claire, he said casually, does he know that you can't have kids? Yes, dad, she replied quietly. Perry knows that I can't have kids. He doesn't mind. So where are the two of you getting married? He asked with a smile. MC, as usual, turned bright red and looked away from her dad. Dad, we're not, she began, but he interrupted. Why are the two of you always holding hands and stuff then? He asked with a smile. I just don't want him to get lost. This porch is pretty big, MC said, trying to lighten the mood. Yes, sure, he responded, until now, no one has ever gotten lost on this porch. Maybe I should make a map of it and post it on the wall so no one gets lost. We all laughed, but MC and I didn't let go of each other's hands. I asked you guys to come over because I'm fed up, MC Stad continued. Mary Claire, you're 25 years old. You have your associate's degree, you're working towards your bachelor's, and you have a job in your own apartment. You have a family and a man who loves you. Don't deny it, Perry. I've seen the way you look at each other. I'm proud of you. He reached out and gently touched MC's cheek. But I want to be proud of your brother too, he said sharply. He's 32 years old and still acts like a teenager. He's been in college for 14 years, and I'm tired of supporting him. I'm pulling the plug, and I need you both to help me with this. MC, since you're hardly ever at your apartment, would you let me sublet it to your brother and Denise? I don't want my grandbaby living in that basement. And Perry, since you're already like my son-in-law, could you get him a job where you work? Anything would be better than nothing. He's been in college forever he must be able to do something. At that moment, a very pregnant Denise waddled out of the house, holding a piece of paper and shouting angrily. She was crying and cursing as I watched. MC immediately went to the boys to cover their ears from their mother's outburst. She looked at Denise and reminded her that the kids didn't need to hear that kind of language. Denise dropped the paper and broke down. MC's parents tried to comfort her. I picked up the note and, after glancing at it, was shocked. I asked MC to take the boys inside and get them something to drink. She offered them soda, and their eyes lit up. 
I read the note aloud after they left. Denise, I can't take this anymore, not one more day. I wish I'd never laid eyes on you. You've really ruined my life. I don't understand why Perry was so upset about losing you. The way I see it now, I did him a favor. He hasn't wasted any time replacing you with my sister. Remember her party? She may have been drunk, but she was telling the truth. Mary Claire now has the perfect life and the perfect man she's always dreamed of. They used to be yours, but while she's happy, I'm stuck with someone I don't want. My parents moved you into the basement without asking me if that's what I wanted. They've tried to mold us into some sort of couple for reasons I can't understand. This isn't the way I wanted my life to go. I don't want a child, I don't want to be a father, and I don't want you. You're not even my type. You're unattractive, and as mentioned before, you're difficult. Even if you had other qualities, I haven't discovered them. Let's face it, Perry is a great guy, and he's been supportive of you for over 10 years, yet you still betrayed him. How could I trust you? He worked incredibly hard to support you, and you still betrayed him. How could I expect you not to do the same to me? I don't even think the baby is mine, I'm convinced something out of the ordinary is involved. I also don't intend to work myself into an early grave like Perry or my dad. I'm not the type to work endlessly to support you and your kids because of a couple of mistakes. I'm smarter than that, college has taught me something. So, with a lighter heart, I'm leaving for greener pastures. Don't bother looking for me, I won't be where you expect. And tell my dad he can be happy now that I'm finally out of his basement. Sincerely, Stuart. As I finished reading the note, Denise began to cry. MC's parents tried to comfort her, assuring her that everything would be okay, but she wasn't convinced. Life has a way of catching up with you when you do bad things. Despite all the deceit and turmoil, things ended up the way they should. After a few challenging months, we moved on. Looking at the couple interested in buying the gaming system, I asked if they wanted to proceed with the purchase. The woman seemed to reconsider, while the man nodded his head. Just then, a beat-up 1980s Yugo with visible rust and damage pulled into the yard. A large woman got out of the car, leaving it running, and a larger man with glasses got out of the passenger side and began examining the items for sale. Their eyes were drawn to the gaming system. That woman just got out of the car, I said to the couple. That's Denise. I wonder what's bothering her now. Denise ran around the yard until she found a baseball bat. She handed MC crumpled bills, saying loudly, here's 50 bucks. It's mine now, right? MC smiled and nodded. Denise then raised the baseball bat and began smashing the gaming system with force. She continued until the system was in pieces scattered across the yard, laughing maniacally as she did so. You ruined my life, she yelled, delivering one final blow. I guess you'll need to look for something else, I said with a smile. The woman from the couple asked how Denise and Stuart ended up back together. We sat back down, and I shared the rest of the story. Over the next few months, things didn't turn out as we had expected. Denise had a baby girl who looked just like Stuart. The paternity was confirmed, and they continued to live in the basement with their daughter. About a month after the baby was born, Stuart called his parents, pleading for help after running out of money and getting caught trying to steal food. He ended up in more trouble when he attempted to flee and accidentally injure a sheriff's deputy. Even though it was an accident, it was considered a felony. MC's parents had to pay a lot of money to get Stuart released. Now, Stuart, Denise, and their daughter are living in the basement, and Denise rarely visits our kids because they're scared of her. They started calling her mommy after we got married. The jail time only made things worse for Stuart, as his felony conviction made it even harder to find work. Denise keeps a close watch on him. His parents insisted on their marriage to give their daughter his last name. Although they continue to argue, things are improving slowly. Denise got a minimum wage waitressing job, and although she's not very successful with tips, she recently bought Stuart a push lawnmower. He now mows lawns for neighbors, competing with local kids for the work. He studied marketing in college and is planning to expand into shoveling snow during the upcoming winter and perhaps raking leaves in the fall. MC came over and brought me another Pepsi, leaned down to give me a quick kiss, and then returned to the boys. So, 
Things turned out well for you? The man asked. I nodded. Buying that game system was the smartest thing I ever did, I said. At that moment, Denise's car sputtered and died. She stopped hitting the remnants of the game system and tried to restart the car, but it wouldn't start. Frustrated, she began pounding on the car and cried. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.